everyone welcome to modern application development part 2 we are now going to look at the topic of graphql right the graph query language now this is going to be a very high level overview right in particular i will not be looking at even the syntax of graphql right much less talking about examples or actually showing you a demonstration of it right this is more looking at why graphql what are the problems it's trying to solve and how it approaches that problem so the first question why okay and we have already seen that rest based apis are endpoint based what that means is specific types of queries are permitted let's say that you want a list of students you can probably just have an endpoint saying slash students you want to get details of a student there will probably be an endpoint saying slash student slash 1 2 3 right but if you have a complex request right get all students above the age of 21 with uh, names beginning with a and who reside in uh, andhra pradesh right how do you do that with a rest api right there's no sort of straightforward way that you can construct such arbitrary queries right so more likely what would happen is you would have to send the entire query across or rather just get the list of students from the server and then figure out how to sort it out at the client end or go and modify the server so that it can take such complicated queries then of course the question becomes how do i specify such queries right i mean can i construct a url that looks something like this possibly right but now look at this why am i using lt over here because i don't want to use the symbol less than because that's a special character for html okay so how should i even construct this is this the right way are there better ways by which i can construct urls should i be even using quotes i guess not i should probably encode them in uh, some way right how do you make arbitrary queries okay so that's one big problem with regard to rest based apis the other question is very often in the design of modern websites we are dealing with inputs from multiple sources right it could be as simple as saying that your user information is coming from one source let's say that i'm using something like you know google authentication right which means that the user database well you would probably have your own copy of a user database but you might be getting it from one particular server which is shared across multiple different applications right i might along with this i might have something you know maybe i'm putting up a blog post but suddenly i have something in the blog that says the latest headlines of the day or the weather in chennai at the moment right so i need to be able to fetch headlines i need to be able to fetch something from a weather api right in other words a modern web app is very likely to have inputs from multiple different data sources of course you could just issue independent queries to each one of them but supposing you wanted to have one entity out there that basically you know is trying to collate information from multiple such sources and get you a common piece of information that needs to get displayed can you still do it yeah you would probably either need to have all the individual queries performed and then handled at the front end maybe your javascript or view or the logic that is written in view would take care of filtering out and showing only what is needed so it can be done right but the question is can you actually tell the server in some way and let the server sort of handle that complexity and give you only the information that you need that's the ideal situation okay and a third sort of interesting point to keep in mind over here is we have already seen the value of declarative programming right so in the context of things like view where i could just specify what i wanted the page to look like and the framework would figure out how to build it for me okay so the fact that i want a binding between a particular variable and something which shows up on the screen or if i want to have certain components that are constructed and you know composed in a certain way i just specify that composition and the actual construction and laying out of those things is handled by the compiler right essentially something which manages the templating and generation of the html this improves the developer experience it makes it much easier to use so can we apply something similar for retrieving data as well okay with all of this in mind the next question that we can ask is okay this sounds interesting how do we go about doing it and it looks as the one approach right i mean it, this can't come for free it can't just be that i magically you know make any arbitrary request i want and the server is going to suddenly become intelligent and tell me what to do but maybe i can create a custom engine on the server side 
that can handle arbitrary requests in a much more complex query language than is just permitted through regular URLs and APIs. Okay? So, you have a sort of proxy layer sitting on the server whose job is to connect to multiple different data sources, collect the data, right? filter whatever you need on the server and respond to the client only with the data that is needed. Okay? That is essentially what GraphQL aims to be. Okay? So, it is a query language. right? How does it function? Well, they once again built on top of the web concept and they said, look, let us use HTTP, but now I want to be able to send sort of more complex queries. So, rather than trying to encode everything into the URL, let me just use POST right? and use the POST body in order to contain the complex query that needs to be sent, which means that the GraphQL engine, so to say, is going to sit as a layer between the client and the server. It is probably sitting at the server end, which means that you know, as, as far as the client is concerned, it now connects to the GraphQL server instead of directly to the back end. The GraphQL server then retrieves or rather receives all these complex queries and it converts it possibly into multiple queries to either one or different servers, fuses the results together, filters and returns only the data that is required. Okay. Now, GraphQL has been, it was developed originally by Facebook, right, and was released as open source around 2015, I believe, and has really taken off in a big way. So, it is quite a powerful construct, right. Ultimately, what it is doing is, it is trying to bring the power of a query language, something like SQL, to the end user directly, right, rather than saying that, oh, you are restricted by these REST APIs, you now have the power of a query language as part of the requests that you can make. Okay? Now, one of the things that that query language gives is it also provides something called a type system. Right? For those of you who have programmed in C, you would know that there are types like int for integers, char for 8-bit characters, right? a string which can hold multiple characters together. There is also bool if you are working with C++. Right? But Python, for example, does not enforce the use of types it still has types. right? So, in Python, for example, there is a distinction between a integer, a floating point number, a character, a list, a dictionary. right? Each of those is a different type of object, right? but it does not enforce the use of types. So, in other words, if I just say a is equal to 5, right? I could then later on use a is equal to hello and it would now be changed from a number to a string. right? And when I say a is equal to 5, do I mean an int or a float? Once again, that is sort of determined by the interpreter at runtime. Okay? So, Python is an example of what is called a dynamically typed language. It does not specify the types of variables up front. GraphQL sort of tells you that you know, using types is a good thing right? and it specifies that each query element, each entity, what kind of type can it have? Right? Is it a string? Is it an integer? Is it a collection of items? Because a large part of what we are doing with regard to you know transferring data back and forth is actually dealing with collections of items. It also allows you to specify relationships between items as part of this type specification. So, you can say that a student is associated with an array of courses. That is, a student can have a list of courses that they are enrolled in. Okay? So, all of this is part of what GraphQL provides to you. It, the query language allows you to specify these types. Okay? All that is done at the server end, which means that the server can now validate any queries that are coming in from a client. It also means that magically, right, the queries that you have can uh, sort of evolve, right, because these queries are now being passed in purely as JSON objects. Okay? I am not giving specific examples over here because I feel that it is beyond the scope of what can be done in a limited lecture. Uh, we, uh, it is definitely worth going into, but it would take a lot more time to explain the details of how uh, GraphQL queries are constructed. Right? The queries themselves are in a form of representation that is very similar to what JSON would look like. Right? So, it would, in other words, it would primarily look like a JavaScript object, which also, interestingly enough, looks very much like a Python dictionary. Right? So, Python dictionaries, JavaScript objects, they look very similar when represented. Right? Uh, 
and the good part about it is because in either a dictionary or in an object you can add or remove keys very easily right you can just specify a key and assign it a value and it's present as part of the object right which means that if i want to add functionality to the api over time it's i don't need to declare a new api version number i can just pretty much add it and whoever was using it earlier would receive only the older data right whereas someone who wants to use the new version of the api can start making requests for new information right similarly i can also mark certain keys as deprecated which means that the server that once again requires a little bit more of work the server will now sort of probably send back a warning along with the response saying don't use this kind of a query in future okay now these queries are not just for retrieving data you can also use them to mutate right similar to the concept of mutations in something like you know view state management right the ultimately what a mutation means is something that changes data in this case the mutations actually update information at a database backend okay so all the crud or rather at least the cud the create update delete part of crud can now be done through mutations in graphql right and the point is this can now be pretty much generalized to any kind of query right which just alters the underlying data store okay so there are a number of different tools that you might want to explore a little bit in order to understand a bit more about how this works one of the most popular today is what's called apollo server which is a set of javascript libraries that's used to build up graphql right and this is where one of the real strengths of graphql comes up right even in their fundamental the tutorial the demonstration one of the things they specify over there is you can connect to multiple backends so a query that you generate might be pulling in data from multiple different backends not just from one database right normally what we are used to is we have a database an sqlite or mysql or postgresql where we store all the information for our system and what graphql is saying is look that's not how real large systems today work i need to be able to systematically get data from multiple sources right so for example can you get me the list of all students who scored more than 85% on days when it was raining in chennai right there's no way i'm going to store the information of whether it was raining in chennai in my database but can i get the information about whether it was raining in chennai of course there is another weather api which has a history information which can allow me to extract that information a graphql server could actually connect to both right why would i want such information that's a different question but there are more realistic examples that you can construct right where you might want to con connect to different apis and fuse them together in order to get more useful information than is possible from any one of them alone now what this means is that everything works around this idea of what's called a resolver right because after all it's not that a graphql engine you just put a polo server in your code and everything is magically taken care of right it still needs to know how to connect to the backend databases it needs to know how to make the queries in fact it needs to know okay if you make some arbitrary query what is permitted and how should i convert that into something that can actually be answered right so the programmer still needs to write code they still need to do or rather the person who is implementing this graphql uh, system right the engine still needs to know that they have to create something called a resolver that takes these requests and then sort of knows where to send those requests how to get the data back how to filter fuse etc and give back only the information that is required to the client okay so apollo server is not a magic bullet you, just, you don't just put it in there and it takes care of you know graphql enabled now you are done no you still have to write a fair piece of code in order to actually get it working and how to make it connect to your different database backends right and then fuse the information together in the way that you want right there are some tools uh, github for example has something called a graphql explorer which allows you to dynamically construct and test queries right and you can sort of type them in and literally on the fly see that requests are made and that gives you updated information about what would be the response for a given query right so in terms of constructing queries debugging them seeing whether your graphql structure is working properly all of these are nice tools to have 
So to summarize, right, the why was GraphQL needed? It's an extension of the core API concepts, right? But it allows you to do a lot more. It basically allows you to integrate with multiple data sources. It's also a complex query language, which means that you can filter the data and restrict what you send to the client to only the relevant data, right? That reduces the network traffic, okay, and sort of makes things better. The important thing to understand is it does not necessarily reduce server complexity, right? In fact, it may even become more complex, right? So it's not as though by reducing the amount of data sent back to the client, we have reduced the complexity of the system in some way. No, that data still had to be fetched and we needed to know what to send. So in some ways, maybe we are increasing load on the server, which means that once again, GraphQL is not just something that you throw in and say, oh, you know, now it's GraphQL enabled, everything is magically taken care of and I reduce the amount of data sent to the client. No, what has happened is that your queries are now being filtered and processed on the server. And if you have done a poor job of that, you might be overloading your server. So you still need to design it carefully. But if that is done, you can construct a system where you balance it out rather than sending a whole lot of information over the network and performing the filtering on the client. You take care of it on the server where presumably, first of all, it's a more powerful system. But secondly, it might also be, you know, something that can be distributed across multiple servers. And finally, you might even be able to cache some of these results, right? Caching is difficult fundamentally in GraphQL because at least at the URL level, you cannot do caching, right? Because it's just a post to a URL that is being used. But if the server by itself knows what the queries are, it might be able to do some other level of caching internally, which is not part of the HTTP caching process, but allows you to get better performance out of the server. Mm -hmm.